Welcome back, everyone. We're in session 16 in this course on spiritual gifts, and you are joining the classroom with students who are also studying this course. We're glad that you're with us. In the last session, we talked about the uniqueness within unity of spiritual gifts. And we said that everyone is unique. Everyone is unique in their giftedness, their temperament, their abilities, their life story. That God has made everyone so unique that there's never been anyone like them, never will be anyone like them. And we talked about the fact that in the list that Paul gives towards the ends of 1 Corinthians 12, this is not a list of gifts in the order of their importance. In fact, it's a list of gifts that represent various categories that we'll be referring to as uh, the roles that people play within the church. Just over the next 21 sessions, we will go through each one of the spiritual gifts one at a time. They'll be organized by uh, the analogy of the body that I talked about previously. Uh, Paul uses the body to help us understand better the body of Christ. And we said that although scripture does not list it this way, it's helpful for us to think in terms of categories of gifts. Some of them representing uh, the brain, others re representing the eyes, the mouth, the heart, the hands, and the feet. And so we will organize all of the gifts that way rather than alphabetically. Just a reminder that a spiritual gift is not what you do well. It might be, but not necessarily. There are times where it is something you don't do particularly well, and yet the Holy Spirit comes to work through you, brings impact spiritually on other people. Spiritual impact is always where, as the result of ministry, people are drawn closer to Jesus Christ. It's like the electrical system in your home. You're the wire. The Holy Spirit is the electricity. The current flows through the wire. And then when it's discharged, the energy transforms, it alters, it changes the situation. This, in fact, is what spiritual gifts are. You may have heard the story about people riding in an airplane 35,000 feet in the air. And suddenly the pilot came on with some disturbing news, but he also had some good news. First he said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. We're sorry, but we do have some bad news to pass along to you. Uh, as we were getting on to our flight today, we forgot to bring the flight plan with us, and therefore we are charting our course the best we can. And in addition, our computer went out and we are unable to uh, contact our flight plan and make sure that we know exactly where we're going. Unfortunately, the radio has also gone out, so the air traffic controllers will not be able to tell us where we are going. But there is good news. We're making good time. Well, how did he know they were making good time? He didn't know where they were. He didn't know where they were going. He didn't know how they were going to get there. There's no way. Somebody needed to know where they were, where they were going, and how they were going to get there. That's what the spiritual gift of administration is. It is literally guiding the helm where someone has their hands on the rudder and they're steering the sailboat. Or on a larger ship, they have their hands on what's called the helm and they're the helmsmen, and they're steering the ship one way and another to make sure that it reaches its destination. All of the uh, spiritual gifts that we're going to discuss during the early sessions will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you'll open up your Bibles there, just to make sure that we see the context of the verse. We also will be uh, talking about uh, a couple of other verses during this session that help to illuminate, illustrate spiritual gifts. Now, spiritual gifts, chapters 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians give us the best picture of what spiritual gifts are. I haven't yet referred to 13 and 14. We'll be doing that in much later sessions. 
So we'll begin with 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 7. Please follow along with me. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. This is a succinct summary of what spiritual gifts are all about. It answers four questions. It tells us who has spiritual gifts, what are spiritual gifts, who gives spiritual gifts, and why are they given. Each one has spiritual gifts. The definition is the manifestation of the Spirit. It's given by God and it's given for the common purpose. Now then a variety of gifts are listed throughout this chapter and we'll be referring to them as we go along. Let's move towards the end of chapter 12 and we'll begin with verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of teaching, those able to help others, those with the gift of administration. We'll stop there because that's the gift we're focusing on in this session. But you can see that Paul uh, mentions a variety of gifts in the section. The Greek word for administration is kobernesis. And for those of you who use Strong's Concordance, it's G2941. The definition of this is literally steerage. It's literally guiding the helm, piloting. It's acting as a guide in a local church, making sure that you reach port, you reach your destination. But there's another view of this, metaphorically. This is not literally. It is, in many, many versions, translated as government or governing. And later, as we'll see, this will bring about some confusion among commentators on what this particular spiritual gift actually means. We're going to use the following definition. The gift of administration is to pilot, guide, or steer as the helmsman of the church. Now, why did God give us this gift? Why is it there? What's the purpose? Well, it is the person who charts the course for the church. The church makes a plan. They have a goal. The person with the gift of administration does not set the goal. The goal is set by others who have the gift of leadership. And the person with this gift of administration, they take that goal and they figure out how to accomplish it. What do we need? Do we need some materials? How much time will it take? How many people will we require in order to have uh, a successful conclusion? They are a key part of the church. And what is their role? In this section that I read of the list of gifts, we said that there were five different roles that people played in the church. And as we continue throughout the study of spiritual gifts, you will see that there are various roles. One is founding the church. The other is instructing the church. The third is uh, managing the church. The fourth is caring for the church. And the fifth one is providing vital information for the church in an emergency. This particular gift of administration quite naturally falls in the role of managing the church. We also said that often gifts cluster together, that there are support gifts that come alongside a spiritual gift and they help make that gift even stronger. Many gifts have certain combinations, certain mixes where the gifts just naturally flow together. In the case of administration, all, very often the gift of helps comes alongside administration, the gift of giving, or, and also the gift of wisdom. Each of these makes a lot of sense. Uh, the gift of helps, very much like administration. Administration they, they make a plan, helps 
actually implement the plan. They're the ones who help set up meetings, schedule, uh, buy the materials, uh, make sure that the actual goal is accomplished according to the plan. Giving makes sense because in giving, money is required to accomplish the goal. And often, God gives money to people in the church so that they can share it with those in the church, both for church programs where resources are unavailable and also to help people who uh, are in need uh, of basic goods, of food, water, shelter, clothing. The gift of giving is a wonderful gift. And the final gift of wisdom, we need wisdom to be able to develop that plan. Now, I want to make sure that you understand these aren't the only gifts that come alongside administration. They're simply used to illustrate the types of gifts that often are used in combination with the gift of administration. Well, I went to the commentaries as I will with each of these. Um, one thing to recognize is no one really knows what the gifts are. As you look at the gifts, Paul just simply says, there's a gift of administration. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, and here's the definition. Just so you guys, like 200 years in the future, you'll, 2,000 years in the future, you'll know exactly what it is. So how do we know what it is? How do the commentators come up with a definition when the Bible itself doesn't provide one? It's very simple they go back and they look for examples of people using what is normally considered administration. And from those examples in the Bible, they try to draw out principles to help us understand what in fact is taking place. Let me give you an example. Would you turn in your Bibles please to Acts chapter 6. And as the commentators are studying, they would go back both in the New Testament primarily, but also in the Old Testament, for we have the full counsel of God. It's both the Old Testament and the New Testament that we can learn lessons. In this situation, there's a crisis going on. There is chaos in the church. It is a good problem. The church is growing rapidly and the infrastructure that's there to support the church is starting to crumble. The elders, the apostles, can't keep up with all the demands, all the needs that are being placed on them. They're to prepare for messages, they're to pray, pray for the church, they're to manage this church, they're to settle disputes. They simply can't do all of this. There are only 12 of them as another one, Matthias, was, was added after Judas uh, betrayed the Lord. So let's read starting in chapter 6 with verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The Grecian Jews, obviously, these were people who were from Greece, which in that time was referred to as Achaia. And then the Hebraic Jews were those who lived in Jerusalem, in Galilee, in the immediate area that Jesus had ministered. And they're fighting. They have widows who don't have food. The Bible tells us over and over again to take compassion, especially on widows, and orphans. There's not enough food to go around. And those people who are doing it are largely from the Hebraic Jews. So human nature being what it is, they make sure that the Hebraic widows get their food first. And then if there's like some left over, we'll give it to the Grecian Jews. Well, this is not good. So the 12, they gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This is a beautiful picture of the gift of administration. There is a problem. 
there is chaos, there is confusion, and somebody has to come along and say, here's how we'll solve the problem. What's the goal in this case? An equitable distribution of the food, despite the ethnicity of the Jews living in Jerusalem. What's the solution? Brothers, pick seven men whom you know to be godly men, and we'll turn this over to those people, and they will be the ones who will make sure that the food is distributed correctly. A beautiful plan. I want to mention that when Paul writes here uh, from the quote that the apostles said we should constant, not neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables, he's not demeaning the idea that they're going to be waiters on tables, mere servants. Instead, he's saying we each have a role to play. Our role is to conduct the ministry of the Word of God. We need someone who will step forward and who will do this other task. And most likely, those were the people with the gift of helps. They very well have, may have been people who had the gift of giving and they had the financial means to help out. They may also have had the gift of wisdom that allowed them to wisely distribute the food to all so that all of the needs were met. So the Bible commentators talk about that example as being a perfect example for us to understand what's the gift of administration when Paul gave no definition. The Bible reference guide says that administration is the wise counsel and direction in the practical affairs of the church. And it may be associated with today what we call the office of deacons. Some churches use different terms, but the terms I'm going to refer to here would provide an example for everyone. The apostles, in essence, were the elders of the church. They were the under shepherds. They were directly responsible to God for everything that happened in the church. And then there are those who are the deacons, like the seven, and they were responsible for the practical matters of the church, such as making sure all the needs were met in the distribution of food to the widows. This continues today, and in the commentaries, they believe that this gift may be associated with that secondary role of deacons. I looked on a website, Ministry Tools, which you can reference at mintools.org. And in that particular internet site, the commentators say, the gift of administration refers to one who steers the body toward the accomplishment of God-given goals and directives by planning and organizing and supervising others. These are not mere office clerks, the ones who type on the computers and keep the files and keep the budget. and the man. That is not what this gift is. That would more be referred to people with those abilities. These are people who are, through the Holy Spirit's power, able to develop, implement, and accomplish a plan to achieve goals, a much different set of skills. In the website Church Growth, which is churchgrowth.com, they say that the gift of administration is similar to bringing a ship into the harbor. Even though that there are rocks and shoals and dangers, and to do it under all sorts of pressures. Think about it, when you have a project underway, everything doesn't go smoothly. Things fall apart, people don't show up, the materials don't arrive when it's supposed to. Those are like the rocks, the obstacles. These people are good at figuring out how to steer the ship around that obstacle and still accomplish the goal. And then my personal view as I've studied these commentaries is I've noticed there's a distinction between early commentators, later commentators, and those who commentate and denote what's in Scripture today. Seems like the early commentators, 
they had the view that this gift was associated with offices. It was associated with the office of deacon. And so everyone in that office should have the gift of administration. Not necessarily a bad thing, but as later commentators looked at this uh, gift of administration, they started to think, you know, it's not really about the office. It's about showing compassion to the poor. And so perhaps this is a gift where they focus on administrating programs that have to do with compassion. And then more modern commentators, a view that I agree with, says no, this isn't about an office. It's too limited to talk about just compassion. It is God working through people to plan and execute and accomplish goals that are important to the church. To me, that makes the most sense. And it certainly is reflected in what we saw in Acts chapter 6 when they chose the 12. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. You know the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes it's helpful to have a visual aid in order to say, okay, I heard all these words, but I need a picture to kind of put it all together. Well, I want you to think about a ship and a person, man or woman, who is given responsibility at the helm to guide the ship. We've talked about it before. What's the purpose of the helm? It's to steer the ship and it's to get the ship to its destination. Sometimes the helmsman must deviate from the planned course due to obstacles or other problems. So does the Holy Spirit work through a person with the gift of administration to accomplish goals efficiently and effectively? The Spirit brings order out of chaos and establishes a smooth, organized process. People with the gift of administration, they love chaos. They love to come into a situation where everything's all messed up. And then they love to, all right, let's get down to it. How could we fix this problem? Now that might not be something you would enjoy doing, but perhaps as you look at this gift, you say, as I have heard these descriptions, I've seen God work in my life that way. Perhaps, indeed, this is my gift. Would you now turn in your Bibles to Exodus, way in the front of the Bible, right after Genesis, as you know, and go to chapter 19, where there's one more biblical example that I'll discuss briefly. You'll remember that when Moses killed the man in Egypt, he became a fugitive. He ran into the Sinai Desert and he met a woman at a well. He married that woman at the suggestion of the woman's uh, father. And that man's name was Jethro. And then for 40 years, for 40 years, Abraham's not in the picture. He's tending sheep. And I think during that time, God spoke to him, gave him lots of verses, lots of character development to say, you know, Moses, in the first 40 years of your life, it wasn't bad that you wanted to free the people of Israel. That's in fact what I want you to do, but I want you to do it my way, not the way you were trying to do it. And Moses, it took a long time for him to get it, to finally get it. So now he's leading the people of Israel. And as we uh, look at chapter 19, we'll see that his father, uh, in law finally comes back to the people of Israel to uh, see how are things going with the people of Israel? How is my son-in-law doing in leading the people of Israel? Well, much like the apostles in New Testament time, they, Moses was frantic. Look at uh, verse 7. 
So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him, and they greeted one another. And Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians of, for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they met along the way, and the, how the Lord saved him. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel and rescuing them from the hands of Israel. Now, let's go down to uh, verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning to evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone as the judge? Why are all these people stand around you from morning to evening? Moses answered, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whatever they have a dispute, it's brought to me. And I decide between the parties, and I inform them God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work's too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. And then as we continue in verse 19, he comes up with a plan where each of the tribes set up officials who will take on those responsibilities, much like the seven who are given responsibility for distributing food, and they become the ones that settle the disputes. And if there's a dispute they can't settle, then they bring it to Moses. And Moses is freed up to oversee the big picture of what the Israelites are doing. In my own life, I have known a person with the gift of administration. His name was Jeff Small. Jeff Small was a business person whose responsibility in real life was to gather financial resources and then plan on how to spend it. And he sensed that God was moving him into a project that my church was undertaking to raise a considerable amount of money. He developed a plan where people would get together in homes and our pastor, who most people have never met because there's 30,000 people, he would come and meet with the people, which by itself was a great thing. And then he would cast the vision. He would tell them, here's the goal we're going to get there. And then he would tell them, and here's how we're going to do it. Now, our pastor didn't come up with the plan. Jeff Small did. And that plan then was implemented. And when we finally gathered to see how much money in this huge amount of money that we were going to gather, which was estimated at $80 million, we found out that, yes, indeed, we had collected $80 million. In fact, we collected more than that. We collected $100,000. It was a good plan that Jeff Small put together. And unfortunately, as has happened all too often in my life, Jeff Small passed away. And it is a shame that we don't have the benefit of this gift anymore, but God's ways are God's ways. So I have some questions for you. Listen to these questions and ask yourself, do I have this gift? Has God worked through you at church to, number one, determine the best way to accomplish a church goal or to complete a church project or event? Have you ever been in that situation? Or would you enjoy being in that situation? Has God ever worked through you to establish timelines, make assignments, develop schedules that allow the church to complete a goal, a project, or an event? And number three, has God ever worked through you to step into a situation in church where you delighted in bringing order out of chaos? If so, you may have the gift of administration, and if so, celebrate because it is a good gift that the church needs.